I've come to the Oval to meet one of the greatest players of the modern game, a man who has scored over 12,000 test runs and 38 test hundreds, but who is also recognised as one of the brightest, most perceptive and most interesting characters in the game. I'm here to find out about his life in Sri Lanka and the events that have shaped him as a cricketer and as a man. Tell me about your father, <laughs> Shema, and the influence that he had on you growing up. Well, yeah, I think um, his influence not just over me, but but all my siblings um, was always very, very great. Um, he was a, a, an attorney at law by profession, played a bit of cricket uh, for St. Anthony's College in Kandy, was more interested in hockey and athletics. And I think um, an accident on the, on the hockey field meant that slowly he lost uh, um, complete sight in his, in his left eye. So, you know, when we were young, he's also been, a, according to him, a race car driver, but Watching him drive a car with just one eye made, <laughs> made us always laugh and say, no, that's, that just cannot be true. So um, growing up, I think the, my parents were very liberal in, in their outlook. Uh, they encouraged us to, to try as, as many things at school as, as, as we possibly could, not just academic work, but also in sport. But the, the overarching message that he gave us all was, if you are actually spending a good amount of time on a certain thing, just make sure you do it as well as you possibly can. Um, well, and th the reason that I ask is that became, he became a little bit of a Twitter sensation <laughs> when you retired. Yes. The man who scored 12,400 test runs, 38 test hundreds, and your dad's reaction was, did he achieve his true potential? I don't think so. <laughs> he could have done more. He could have done so much better. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it, the funny thing with this, right throughout my career, it never mattered to him how many runs I scored. It just mattered to him the way I batted. So he was a man who also told me, if you want to know cricket, you've got to first read books, forget playing, taking up a bat. You just got to know the history, the culture of the game. And he said, that's where you start with. So I was bombarded with books. Um, when I was young, before cricket, it was a, a novel um, uh, given to me on Monday and said, on Friday, I'm asking you questions, just be ready. And for some reason, I was the only gullible one out of my siblings that actually <laughs> fell for these things because everyone else refused. But since I was the youngest, I probably said, ah, okay, fine. And um, I used to read it as much as possible. And then, and true to his word, Friday would be question day. And then, so that got me into a habit of reading. Um, and he always told me, if you want to learn about batting, you need to read C.B. Fry. Um, and then, of course, the Don on, on, mm -hmm. on the art of batsmanship. Mike Brearley on on the art of captaincy. Um, so much so that I think he came to England to watch one of my first games here um, in 2002 or something like that. And I think Charles Fry was there at the MCC mm -hmm. and I think he had either met my father or heard him speak about C.B. Fry. And he came in and spoke to me and said, you know, he was my grandfather and I, would, I have a, a, a present for you. And out of the blue, he presented me with a second edition book of Mm -hmm. the art of batsmanship. So I sent it to my father. And um, I remember being on tour well into my test career and suddenly at about two in the morning, the hotel reception would call from England or somewhere, New Zealand somewhere and say, oh, there's an urgent fax for you from home. Uh, and I, I'd jump out and think, oh my God, what's happened? Someone's sick. Or... And then I stopped to think like, who in the right mind would send a fax if something's urgent? <laughs> then I say it's got to be my father because he doesn't carry a cell phone, doesn't know how to do his email. Um, and then it'll turn out to be two pages of C.B. Fry's bat on, or a, a mm -hmm. passage on batting from the C.B. Fry book or from Bradman underlined and said, please read this before you go into bat because this is going to help you. Uh, so, <laughs> so it, well, is it was quite funny. I mean, you know, there was a, this hashtag Kumar's dad that yeah. went around on Twitter. And a couple that I wrote down, Jesus walked on water, but had he taken all my advice and knuckled <laughs> down, he could have walked on steam. Hashtag Kumar's dad. Talk to me about Usain Bolt being the greatest when he breaks the sound barrier, okay? <laughs> hashtag Kumar's dad. I mean, it, it says something about um, his influence on you. I mean, clearly he was quite a pushy parent he, to some degree. He, he was, but not in a in a destructive sense. He never tried to live vicariously through us, like he, or his sporting ambition or anything of the sort. But I always realized that, uh, let's say on a weekend, he'd wake me up at about six, seven in the morning. I tried to pretend to be asleep, but he somehow wake me up, take me out to the backyard where we had uh, what was earlier a badminton court, then turned into a tennis wall and half a tennis court. 
where he'd be throwing tennis balls at me to, to bat with or do shadow batting. Um, and eight o'clock would come by, nine o'clock would come by, my mother would come and say, what are you doing to that child? That's torture, let him go have breakfast. And he said, no, 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 hold on, hold on, we're working on something. Once he gets through this, he can, he can then eat. And his clients would come for consultations and they'd be sitting outside and my mother would say, your clients are here. He said, listen, if they want to meet me, either they wait, if they don't want, they can go because tell them I'm spending time with my son. Mm -hmm. So you actually realize the commitment that he made to us was amazing. It was never about, uh, he could have gone and you know earned this consultation fee or t taken on a new case or everything was secondary to that two, three, sometimes four hours that he continuously spent me with me on a weekend. Um, and you understand suddenly that why parents do that. It is not about imposing themselves their ideas on you, but it's just all about, you know, love. You know, mm. you love your child, you want them to do well. Um, sometimes it can go, it can happen in a negative way where, like you say, it could be mm -hmm. destructive. Mm -hmm. But in this case, for both my sister, my second sister who was a tennis player, and for myself, it was something that gave us a really good grounding and an, and an idea about what it took to really, if we wanted to pursue this as a career, and become a professional sportsman, and that's a decision I made last. My father never told me at mm -hmm, 13, 14, mm -hmm. you have to play for mm -hmm. Sri Lanka, you have to be an international. No, it was just about being the best that I could be. And if I decided to play, yes, so be it. Um, and that was, that was a great lesson. Um, and I look at my children now, and I sometimes tell them, okay, what about swimming, or what about this? And then they play it one day and say, oh, I don't really like it that much. And I say, listen, let's get better at it. You get better at it, you actually start enjoying mm -hmm, it more. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, once you've invested a bit of time and enough time to make an informed decision, yes, then we can decide or you can decide and tell me that this is, you don't like it. But sometimes we, just because of like or dislike, I think we miss a lot of opportunities rather than really investing some real time in seeing something through. You were born um, in 77 up in the capital of the hill country in Kandy. Most people say that cricket is a products of their <coughs> environment. How did uh, being from Kandy shape you as a, as a cricketer, ultimately? Um, in Kandy, growing up, um, it was a strange thing. I, was, I went to a school. Um, I mean, Trinity College, Trinity famous College. school. The, your school ground is a test ground. Absolutely, but it's a rugby school. Cricket was never, <laughs> you know, it was never my ambition to play cricket at, you know, at any stage for the country or even for Your the school. Your great mate Mahala was a bit of a schoolboy prodigy, Mahala wasn't he? Was but a you genius. not so much. Mahala was, I was I, not even comparable, <laughs> right. not even comparable. It's, Mahala was a schoolboy genius. At 17, if anyone watched him bat, uh, guaranteed mm. to play international cricket. Tilan Samravira, watching him at 17, We'll play. I wish we could award than a yes, of course. Um, I actually seriously started playing cricket when I was about 16, 17, switching from the other sports. Um, so Candy itself... I wondered, I mean, it's a bit cooler, a bit greener up in Candy. I'm thinking about your development as a batsman now. I, Somebody scored runs all around yeah, the world. I, I think a bit that... more that balance, was, a bit more movement up Absolutely. There, so Candy, cooler climate, rains a hell of a lot. Um, I remember having consistent result for like a week mm -hmm. without stopping. So the, the, the pitch was always green at Asgiria when you played under 17 onwards on turf. And we always had fast bowlers because that's what the, the, the pitch dictated. And you learn to play on wickets and conditions that had swing and seam. So I think that was one of the main reasons why I was more adept against faster mm -hmm. bowling rather than actual spin, because right throughout my developmental stage, I played on tracks that helped fast bowlers. And you learn to play on the back foot, you learn to cut and pull. Um, um, and you, something that was alien to other schools, because if you go to certain other schools, it would just rag square from day one. Um, so in that sense, the, 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 the conditions in candy, all of that really helped me develop as a, as a, as a batsman.